Thank you, Lord. Amen. So good to be here tonight. And we're not strangers. Some of you may not know me. But uh, Christmas for Christ is upon us. I don't want to take up too much time. I've got lengthy notes here. But I do want to say uh, last year that the Lord, uh, matter of fact, you may be seated for just a moment. Last year, the Lord allowed us to see in our province some new churches that had not gotten on board. And uh, our concept all along is that pastors simply let their churches give. People want to give. People believe in the kingdom of God. And sometimes as uh, ministers, we become afraid that so much money will leave the church that we won't pay our own bills. And so we've, we've tried to encourage ministers to just let their people give. Let God do it. And I know this church does. I'm very excited that one of our churches that had been locked up in fear last year decided to allow us to come and present to their church. And uh, I believe they have about uh, 40 people. And they ended up giving $15,000 to Christmas for Christ with 40 people there. <clears throat> it not only shocked the church, it shocked the pastor who had been nervous and uh, what he did not expect was that the very next week, one of the brand new mobile phone companies in the area came to him and said, we are looking for a place to place our new antenna for our mobile service, and your light pole happens to be right where we need it. And we'd be willing to pay you. We'll put a new light pole on that goes a little higher. We'll pay you uh, a monthly amount if you let us put an antenna on that lamp pole. And then it came back with a counter offer. They said, we've decided we just want our own pole there. We'll pay you more if you let us put a pole there right next to your lamp pole. This is right on the street. No property is being taken from the church. And uh, they said, we would like to offer it to you, but we also want to have a contract that can be renewed for 20 years. And by the time they got done signing the deal, it came to just under a half a million dollars into that little church of 40 people. And I could tell you story after story, just like that in our province, God is helping our ministers to not fear. Uh, there may be things that have caused us to fear in the past, but we, with a little bit of teaching, we can mitigate that. But it's wonderful when God's people are just released to give and that God can let resources flow like a river. So glad to be here with you. I love my my family, your pastor and his wife, and uh, this is probably as good a time as any to let them know that they're on our calendar for September of 2018. The, that was what they decided at our annual planning event last week, so I meant to ask you earlier, but... Uh, he said we like to have fun, didn't he? <laughs> we love having them. Our church loves the Betchers. And we've had miracle signs and wonders. We had one lady, uh, when your pastor was there, prayed for a uh, basketball-sized tumor. Disappeared as we prayed in Jesus' name. One lady walked in the back door. <clears throat> Amen. Isn't God good? I'm glad that people serve him and believe. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. That was, and we, we give God glory, but aren't you glad that people walk in faith? There are. God did give gifts to men. And so your pastor walks in that. And another lady walked in at the end of one revival who had detached retina. She came in with uh, dark glasses on and one of those walking canes. And before she got just past the back door of our tiny building, uh, the Holy Ghost fell on her. The service was over. People were getting ready to fellowship. Holy Ghost fell on her. She received the Holy Ghost and began to speak with the other tongues. And then she came down to the front row and took off her glasses and went on to inform us that she could see. We didn't know she was blind other than that these, uh, these different looking glasses were on her. God reattached her retina as well. He was filling her with the Holy Ghost. He does all things well. Thank you, Lord. I can tell this is a church that's 
used to being thankful for the blessings of God. Thank you, Lord. We've got just about 50 minutes left of our time. I want to get into our thought for tonight. And I, I did ask your pastor if he wanted me to preach or teach. He said either one. I will tell you, I love teaching. It's one of my passions. And so I hope you'll bear with me. I won't be able to teach like your pastor. But hopefully I can be a supplement and a blessing. And I want to read from Isaiah 26, verse 3. And if it is your custom to stand, please feel free. So thankful that he's allowed me to be in this pulpit again. And that he's allowed me to be in his tree stands every other day. It has been wonderful. Isaiah 26, 3. Uh, if you're new here tonight or almost new, I don't want to chase you off with this Bible study. Um, you'll understand in a minute. Uh, I'm, I don't think this is just for people that have been living for God a long time, but you might as well understand up front that living for God, he has some ups and downs. Amen. But there's power in walking with God. He can keep you. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace. I'm reading from the New King James, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I'm going to talk for a few moments about staying power, about staying power. You can be seated. And uh, if I was at home, we would have just gotten done. Wednesday night is wild back home and uh, almost almost more powerful than Sundays for some reason. It's the culture of our church, and I love the worship that I feel here. But there is, uh, there's no doubt that we are living. I don't know if you have felt it. I have felt a tremendous and increasing spiritual pressure uh, on my, my person, on the church. Uh, right now, it may be particular to the Northwest. I'm sure there is an increasing pressure here as the climate of our nation changes, and uh, especially those who are tuned and trying to stay on the cutting edge of their walk with God, you feel a, a pressure to uh, cave in. There's a, a, an increasing pressure to pull back and not fight so hard. And uh, ironically, this pressure is coming right at a time when it seems like we're in a generation that has less stamina, less commitment to uh, discipline, and maybe just less backbone, period. And yet God knows what generation we're in. I don't think he's made a mistake in putting us here or expecting so much of us. It's just simply that we're going to have to learn to lean on him the way he intended. Amen. The Bible says that he will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is stayed on him. Uh, whenever you see the word perfect in the Bible, it just simply means complete. Wherever, whatever stage it is at. Um, God called Noah a perfect man, Abraham a perfect man in their generations, and yet we know that Noah had some issues. You read the story carefully. He was not perfect in the measurement that we would consider perfect, nor was Abraham, but God looked at them and said they are perfect. They have dealt with everything at the level that I've communicated with them about. There's nothing they've left on the table undone that I've addressed in their lives. That is what God considers perfect. I don't know that each one of us will be at the same level of spiritual uh, conditioning by the time he comes to take us back, but we can't all be perfect in the eyes of the Lord when he comes back. Think about that. If you have uh, dealt with God honestly and sincerely and opened yourself to him, and if there's things he's addressed in your life and you've been willing to deal with those things instead of pushing them off in the back corner, when the trumpet sounds, the Lord will come for you and you will be perfect in his eyes. Isn't that wonderful? I hope that just lifted a load off of somebody. That doesn't mean we can take advantage of the grace of God. We know that. But simply that I'm doing the best I can. And God, uh, I did pray one time. I remember praying, saying, God, I thought I was being sincere. And I prayed for a long time, this prayer. God, show me every error and every sin in my life and every area that needs work. Show it all so I can deal with it. And I prayed that again and again and again until one day the Lord said, would you stop praying that? And I said, why? I want to please you. He said, if I showed you everything that we have to work on together, you would quit right now. But he said, if you'll just work on what I talked with you about last week, 
We can keep doing business. And you'll be perfect in my eyes. So work on what God's doing. Uh, I, I'd like to joke with our church. I say uh, spiritual third grade could be the best 10 years of some of y'all's life. If you, don't, if, you will, if you don't quit pushing what God's trying to deal with in the back room, uh, he's not like our school system that will just issue you into the next grade. You will continue that class until you pass. <laughs> I may be talking to someone that's thinking from running, about running from your trial. Let me tell you what, you will start over where you end up. <laughs> you can run, but you cannot hide. Amen. God is the school teacher in the house today, and he goes with you. Amen. He's not, the lesson doesn't end with a building or a group of people. It follows you, and you just start over wherever you decided to run away. Just ask Jonah, and uh, that's not in my lesson. Let's keep going. He will keep us in perfect peace. How many know that the battle is in the mind? Amen. You're not battling with your human body so much. You really aren't. You're not battling with outside uh, sources. You are really battling with your mind. I'm not going to dwell on that too long other than to say that it's where every spiritual battle is won or lost. Everyone. Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations or arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It is all in the mind. And uh, like a good soldier, the mind has to be trained and disciplined. The harder you live for God, the easier it is. Amen. Even battle can become easier if you condition well. If you're disciplined in your daily life, if you uh, slack off and you lay back in your walk with God, then the trials that come our way and they will come whether we're ready or not will feel more overwhelming. Amen. They'll, you'll, you'll scream harder. <laughs> you'll kick harder. You'll throw a bigger tantrum. Come on, has anybody here ever thrown a Holy Ghost tantrum in front of God? I have. I have. And he just sits back and lets you kick. And scream until you're done. And then he talks just like he wanted to do in the beginning. All right. So we, we condition this mind of ours. The Bible says he wants to keep our mind in perfect peace if we're stayed on him. And so uh, there, it behooves us to make up a lot of things in our mind in advance. And I'm just laying some ground for work for where we're going into the scripture. But I don't want to wait till we get to the battleground to have some decisions made. There ought to be some things that just are yes and no. Some things that are uh, within limits and some things that are off limits. And I always think of Joseph when I think of that particular uh, point. And he, he was tempted by Potiphar but really was not because he had made up that decision so very long ago. There really was not a decision being made in Potiphar's house uh, by his wife, but uh, he had made that decision long before he got to Egypt. I will serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. And so we, we need to make up some things in our minds and just settle them. Half of the battle that you will face will be made by just some decisions that are settled and left there for good. Bury them. Don't pick them up again. But for the rest of those parts of our mind that still have to do war, the Bible says that we can be in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Somebody say stayed. stayed. All right, I want to focus for the rest of the lesson on that word. It simply uh, means this, to prop, to lean, to take hold of, to bear up, to establish, to lay, to lean, to put to rest. It goes on with several others. I'm going to just walk down through this because if we don't understand what to stay, our mind on the Lord means we're going to miss what God's going to give us as a benefit as a result of that. Uh, he said, I want you to stay your mind on me. I want to focus on the first word. It just means to prop. And what is it that we prop up? How do we prop our mind up in the Lord? Things uh, that are either falling or have the potential to fall get propped up. It's, it's often in our neck of the woods. They, they worship trees there. I don't know if they do that here, but uh, trees are valuable. We have little silver tags on every tree in our church property. It has been inventory. 
by the township. They know what trees are there, what size they are, how old they are, and they know that we are not allowed to touch them. And, uh, and I had to get permission. We just bought an extra property, and we cut down over 100 hazelnut trees in about a two-month period, and I had to get permission and prove that they were dead. And, but there are other trees on the land that are propped up. They were propped up before we got there. At some point in time, they either showed the disposition of being able to fall or they had fallen a little bit, and so they, they jammed some posts up. They put some cables on, and it doesn't look very pretty, but it helps the tree to stand when it's leaning or in soil that can't hold it. And so the Bible says sometimes we're going to have to prop up our mind with the thoughts of God. We're going to have to take something that is leaning in a wrong direction. When we feel ourselves even beginning to tip toward a wrong area, we can begin to undergird that area with the word of God and to begin to stay our mind on him or prop up our thoughts, if we will, with the precious word of God. It means to support or to prevent from falling. And we, we don't wait till I had a tree go down. And when we looked at the tree, the root system was much smaller than what was required to hold it up. Uh, that was not the best time to prop it up. It was, it was about time to get the chainsaw at that part, part and turn it into firewood. But uh, the best time to prop it up would have been a long time before it fell over. Had we known. And so the Lord's peace is upon those who see the potential of falling and they care so much about walking with God that they literally, intentionally, on purpose, uh, in front of the problem, get up underneath it and begin to prop it up with the Word of God because they realize and they honor the fact that we cannot stand without the Word of God. I can't make it on my own. There's nobody strong enough in their minds to, to walk from beginning to end in this life with God without propping themselves up. It's more than a crutch for the weak. It's a necessity for everybody. Everybody's got to have the word of God. I don't want to wait till it's falling. And then it goes on to say that the word stayed means to lean. And uh, if you look at it, it suggests a relationship with God more than a need to lean. And the thing that comes immediately to my mind is that disciple that Jesus loved. The Bible says that as they celebrated that Passover supper right before Jesus' crucifixion, that the disciple that Jesus loved was leaned up against him, leaned against his chest. Now, I don't know how you feel about leaning up against another man or leaning up against anybody particular that's not your spouse, but uh, that, that's a pretty close relationship. That takes a certain comfort level to lean on somebody. Imagine just leaning against the person next to you in the pew right now and what their response might be. I think I made my point. John was all laid up on Jesus, leaned over on him, and uh, it, it meant that there was a relationship here. Uh, it means I, I don't want to. Not only can I not make it without you, I really don't want to make it without you. I want to be with you. I want to have this relationship. This is an aspect of our mind being stayed on God that's got to come from deep within. Amen. It cannot come from a daily bread program. It can't come from an annual theme in your church. It's got to come from a deep down desire that says, God, I've come far enough with you that this is more than about rules and regulations. It's, it's more than about ticking off the box next to my Bible reading. I want to be with you. I, I'm not sure I want to go any further if I know you're not there. Amen. I, I trust you, God. I want to walk with you. And I want to know you, and, and uh, you do it out of friendship. I don't wait till crisis when I'm at this stage. Why is it that we always wait for crisis to happen? And then we whip open our Bible. We pray that prayer, God, whatever the Bible falls open to, that's going to be the scripture you've given me. Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> don't live for God that way. Don't, don't let that one testimony of where it actually worked cause you to make that your way of living for God. That is not the way to have a relationship with God. Amen. There might be a rare exception to that. I don't want to excuse that, but uh, 
Have a relationship with him. And don't wait for crisis. This leaning upon the Lord is not the picture of someone in crisis. This is the picture of someone in relationship who is daily propping himself up or herself up with the word of God. Daily making efforts, not waiting until the car is swerving off the road. But saying, listen, if I don't, if I don't walk with you, it, it will swerve off the road. It goes on to say this, so we've, we've propped, we've leaned. It goes on to say to take hold of. So now the Lord is saying, I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind takes hold of me. Grabs hold. Uh, in other words, uh-oh, the plane is about to experience turbulence. Does <laughs> anybody ever uh, drive a truck or a car that has one of those handles on the passenger side? Uh, right up by the, the windshield, there's a little D handle there. And you say, what in the world is that for? Our wives know what it's there for. My wife uses it regularly. That's the take hold of handle right there. That's, that's after we've propped ourselves up. We've got a relationship with God, but things are still getting a little rocky. In spite of my best efforts, the plane seems to be bouncing a little bit harder than my seatbelt can hold. It's time to take hold of the Lord with everything I've got. It's time to dig in and grab on. It's not time to walk up and down the aisle of the plane. It's time to sit down and be serious. Put your computer away. Don't worry about the peanuts and the pop. It's time just to focus on being safe. There are times in our walk with God, if you're going to have peace with God, you're going to have to hang on. Hang on to him. Leaning alone at this point is no longer enough. It's good. Without leaning, you'll be in a whole lot more trouble at this point. But this word literally means to grab on to Jesus or to take hold of him with tenacity and not let go. Hmm. And then it says to bear up. To bear up. How many knew that to lean on the Lord, to have your mind stayed on him could mean so many things? It means to bear up if you start to fall. Now this isn't supposed to happen to born again believers. Especially ones who have been walking with God for a long time. But this bearing up is different than propping up. Propping up is a precautionary method bearing up happens in the in the moment the bible says if you fall the angel of the lord will bear you up that's the only point you dash your foot against a stone satan used that on jesus uh, that was talking about falling in the moment and there is a point in time where it is possible for even those who have propped themselves up and have grabbed hold of God and uh, entered in, leaned on him, that even then they might need borne up by Almighty God because David even said, my feet started to slip. If you start to fall, in other words, it's not too late. I want, to, I want to just stop for a moment. If someone is starting to fall, it's not time to quit at that point. It's not time. If you find your mind starting to waver and to stagger, it's not time to say, well, I tried. I guess I can't do any better. I might as well give in. I might as well say what I feel like saying. I might as well just go ahead and do what I'm struggling with doing. I might as well give up. I did my part, and I'm still falling. But the Bible lets us know that there's still hope for you at that point in time. You're not excused from trying to live for God at that point. At no point in time are we excused from our efforts to walk with God because at no point in time does he become incapable of keeping us by his power. Even if I start to fall, we can become borne up by fixing our mind on him. Amen. The scripture says he will catch us. And how many can testify that the Lord has caught you in the fall? Amen. Hey, Amen. There's, there's been a few plane rides I've been on. There's been a few plane rides I've been on where things I thought maybe, and I pray a little prayer before I get on every flight. 
And I, I always remember the story of Paul on the ship, so I, I'm not selfish. I don't say, God, just save me. <laughs> say, God, would you keep this plane from harm, from fear, and from danger? And I say, I don't just mean me, God. I mean everybody on this plane. Keep them for my sake. Because I know I can't die until God's done with me. And when he is done with me, I can't live. <laughs> it's pretty cut and dried. But I thought I might take a few with me. If he's going to bless me, bless them too, Lord. And, uh, but there's been a few flights I've been on where it, it just felt like it was going to drop. Sometimes we dropped 20, 30 feet, I think. I don't know how far it went. It felt like a big drop. And uh, it felt like the engines weren't even working. Somebody had sawed the wings off. But suddenly, at the last minute, it bore up. Made me a little sick to my stomach, but I was sure glad that it didn't keep on going for about 30,000 feet. Amen. So it is possible that the Lord, if we, if we are in a falling moment, if we start to cave in, if you feel weak in your mind, don't stop there. Grab out, uh, reach out one more time for the mind of God. Grab on to the word of God. Yeah. Amen. Say that scripture one more time. Get it in your heart. Pray about it. And uh, don't let yourself go. Right. Amen. The next part says lie hard. I'm very familiar with this, and some of you are too. Lie hard. That doesn't mean tell untruths. That means get down. This, uh, this suggests a lowering of a center of gravity. Now, trying to think of a good example without using myself. But I did used to like to ride in the back of pickup trucks. Now, that's illegal now. So I heard, I heard that. Somebody else has done that. <laughs> I used to like to stand up in the pickup truck. You know, and then they'd weave back and forth. And whoever's driving trying to knock you out of the truck. Because that, that's just all good fun, right? And uh, that's insanity. It's a miracle I'm still here. But we, we learn. You learn pretty quick. When they start weaving the car like this and they're barreling down the road, what do you do? You get down on your knees, your hands and knees, and you lower your center of gravity. If that doesn't work, you just flat out sprawl out. You go spread eagle on the bed of the truck because the lower you are, the lower your center of gravity is, the less chance of flying out of the back. So when the scripture, I wish I could tell you that the scripture about perfect peace just meant the wind was going to stop blowing. And that the storm would stop and that the truck would stop doing crazy things. But it's possible that in the midst of perfect peace, you might find yourself spread eagle on the ground in the midst of your problem trying not to get knocked off the truck. Hello, somebody. It's not just propping ourselves up now. We're talking about just getting down as low as we can, as humble as we can in prayer. God, I don't even know what to say in prayer anymore. I'm just getting as low and as humble as I can. I don't know what to ask for. I don't know what to tell you to do for me. I just know I'm feeling tremendous pressure, and I'm getting down as low in your presence as I can. I just want to make it, Lord. It's like you would do if you were going down 100, 100 miles an hour down the road. You, you would get down low. And at this point in time in your storm, you're not getting any breaks. There's no time to do precaution, take precautionary methods. If you haven't propped up by now, you, you're not going to prop up at that point in time. If you haven't leaned and had a relationship with God, this is not a great time to begin a relationship with God. You're, you're gasping for breath, but hopefully by then you've done some of these things. Even if you have a deep relationship with God, at times you are going to find yourself flat on your face, keeping yourself low and your center of gravity down. Amen. And just praying, God, help me get through this time. You don't get breaks. Like Paul and his shipmates, you do everything you can not to get tossed overboard, and then you just pray, God, let the morning come. Am I talking to anybody? You just pray, God, let the morning come. If you've never had that, uh, hang on. Just wait. But enjoy every single moment until that point. <laughs> and if you are in it right now, 
don't give up. And if you've already been through it, don't get bitter. Because there's a danger of this hanging on. This, this laying flat. There's a danger in that particular season of lying hard. It, it's not in that you're going to get thrown out of the truck. It's that lying down hard and hanging on can become a lifestyle. Long after the truck has parked. Long after the ship has stopped rocking. If we're not careful, we'll still be laying down waiting for the next storm. And we're not productive at that point. Amen. I'll, I'll be transparent with you right now. And uh, because I thought that because I had taught this lesson over a year ago that I had solved all those issues. But recently in a minister's retreat, I, uh, we were blessed to have Brother Williams teaching, phenomenal teaching, talking about offense. And uh, by the time he got done, he said, would you all pray and ask God to help you with the offenses that you have toward someone else? And I, I wasn't trying to be like the Pharisees or the religious rulers. I seriously took inventory. I said, God, I finally just raised my hands. I said, Lord, I thank you that you have given me a life at this point free from offense. And it wasn't off my lips when the Lord said, what about your offense toward me? And I was stunned. I said, what are you talking about? And he flashed me back to a point in time in my teenage years when he took me through a trial that caused my prayer life to pull back because I didn't want to go into that dimension of prayer ever again. And he said, you got through that, but you never gave me that part back again. You still live for me, but he said, you've never given that part of your prayer life back. Then he flashed me forward to a season of my business that I went through not too long ago. I've still got some bandages on from that one. And uh, he said, you know, I've been meaning to talk with you about that. He said, you got through that, but it wasn't completely by trusting in me. He said, part of that storm you got through by shutting off. And I'm being transparent so I can help somebody. He said, you didn't lean on me like you're supposed to, you just shut the feelings off. And you barreled on through. And he said, you're going to have to turn that on before we can do any more business. And I thought that the tears would flow and that I would have an immediate release. I knelt down and prayed, and I wept for a long time. But at the end of that prayer, I said, God, I, I don't know that I have the ability to switch this overnight. But I said, if you'll keep bumping me every day, and showing me what area to turn back on, I promise that I will do my best to flip the switch every single morning. There's just there's a danger sometimes. You can you can go you can ride the storm so long that you don't want to let go of, of what you've been hanging on to. You don't want to get back up again. You're in safety mode. But we can't be productive. There's a reason why we have to go through the storm. If I, don't, if I don't get to the end, we're almost done, and I'm not even halfway through. If we don't get to the end, uh, through, uh, to the end of it all uh, like we're supposed to, if we don't get through the end and, and realize that there was a purpose in that and we just get into duck mode. I, I heard one preacher say one time, he said, I, I wonder if Isaac ducked every time Abraham carved the Thanksgiving turkey. Fair enough. I wonder if every time Abraham said it's time to go sacrifice, if Isaac took a vacation. And I, I, thought, I thought that was clever when I first heard it. I related to that because I was in the midst of my own storm. But the Lord spoke to me. I actually brought that up to God in that prayer. I said, God, what about Isaac? And he said, Phil Lemke, do you really think Isaac ducked the rest of his life? He said, have you read the rest of Isaac's story? Yeah, I have. He said, does it look like a man who's terrified of me? I said, no, it doesn't. Does it look like a man whose faith has been dashed on the rocks? No, it does not. Looks like a man who trusts you implicitly, God. He said, yes, he did. Isaac's faith was not crushed. He already had a deep relationship with me. He trusted God on the mountain. He trusted God after the mountain. His faith was not stolen by that experience. It was increased. And he said, that's what's supposed to happen when you come through the storm. Amen. My God. 
God, help us not to fall into the danger of continuing to hang on when, you're, when the storm has passed and it's time for us to move on. Amen. If, if we could ever get a glimpse of what God sees. Listen, if, if God's taken you through some things, it's he trusts you. you it's, it's not new. You've heard that before. He trusts you, but I'm not sure how completely we would believe that. I did ask God one time, one of, the, one of my foolish questions. I like to ask God. It's okay to ask God questions as long as you don't question God. But I asked him, I said, God, why is it that I, I can point to so many of my contemporaries in ministry and apparently you haven't allowed them to go through these things? Don't do that. <laughs> Aren't you glad God is love? But he did say something very nice. He said, Phil, I cannot trust them with that. He said, they would not endure. And he said, I promised that I would never place anything on one of my kids that they could not endure. He said, then the time comes that they can. And I said, okay, so you're putting it on me because you think I can make it. Yes, I do. He said, I know you can make it if you keep leaning on me. And it strengthened me because about the time you think you have gotten to the point where you cannot take any more, you're about halfway there. <laughs> well, you're clapping that that would have discouraged a lot of people. <laughs> right about the time you think you're under so much pressure, you can't take another step. You're about 50% of the way. Because God only knows how far you can really stretch. But rest assured, he will not stretch you beyond the snapping point. He knows where everybody's breaking point is. He will never take you there if you keep your mind stayed on him. If you jump ship halfway through, all deals are off. But if you will lay down tight to the deck and hang on and say, God, I'm not leaving you no matter what. I will not let go. I don't understand what we're going through, but I know that what I have experienced with you is real. I will not leave you. And you hang on. You hang on. There is no shame in hanging on. We need to just dispel that. There's no shame in hanging on. It's right there in the Word. God will keep you in perfect peace if you will hang on. Just lay as flat as you can. Get down on the deck and just wait for the morning. Sometimes it's necessary. Amen. One, uh, I'm going to skip over part of this because we'll never get to the rest. One other portion of that says to rest yourself. To rest self. All right. So after you have been laid out on the deck, hanging on, waiting for the day, there does come a morning, by the way. There does come a morning. It gets so dark sometimes. I, I can recall, and I'll, I'll have another transparent moment. I'm trying to teach on transparency in our, in our Bible class, so I might as well be transparent. Uh, there was a dark moment just several years back where God, probably my lowest point, God alone knows how to bring you down to the lowest point. And it's not the same for all of us. For some, it might be the death of a loved one. Uh, others, it might be financial burden. It, it, God knows what it takes. And uh, I, I will tell you, I was, I was at the, the point where uh, I don't know. I just didn't know what else to do. I didn't, uh, didn't feel like even hanging on anymore. I knew I couldn't let go, but I just didn't realize if, if I had any strength. And God, God, at that point in time, the phone rang. Somebody in Indiana that I hadn't seen in 15, 17 years, I believe it was at the time, and uh, had not communicated with him. He said, Phil, he said, God woke me up last night praying for you. He said, I saw uh, you sitting on the front row of a church. And he went on. He said it was a gray building with white trim. He said, I've, I don't know if that means anything to you. He said, you were sitting on a front pew uh, off to the right. That's always where I sat. And he said, you were facing the platform. He said, everybody in the church was laughing, was enjoying themselves. They were worshiping God. But he said, you were slunch, uh, slouched down, and there was a dark cloud over you. And he said, you were, you were muttering curses. He said, you were muttering curses. And I, he said, I knew you were in trouble. And, he, and the Lord prompted me. He said, this is where... Uh, Satan wants to take him if you don't pray. 
And so he said, I want to know, you to know I have been up all night praying. He did not know that at the time he started praying, I had been under an extreme situation. I felt pressure just spiritually lift off of me for a moment. Sometimes pressure doesn't leave. Sometimes God just lets it lift for a while. All right? It just lifts for a while. You're not done. The storm's not over, but God knows you can't take anymore. Uh, and then I felt the pressure come back on a little later on. I was so thankful for that. I said, you know what? That's the church that I pastor. That's, you just described the building to a T. You described where I sat. I said, I'm not cursing God, but I said, I, I thank you for the prayers. I, I know that's what the enemy's trying to do. What he didn't know is that all through the last week, words I have never used kept flowing through my mind. I said, can that happen to believers? I guess so. I never have been someone who cursed. In my, in my worst day, I, didn't, I don't enjoy cursing. I don't like people who curse around me. I, th I don't like the feeling of it. But these words just flooded my mind. Enemy trying to take somebody out. Amen. That very same week, still feeling that pressure coming down. And uh, the phone rang. I had, I had just got down on the floor. Not even having never taught this lesson, I just got down on the floor flat physically. I said, God, I can't do any more. So I don't even know what to pray, so I'm just going to lay here. And the phone rang. I don't know why I picked it up, because that's not really a great time to pick up a phone, except that I was running a business at the time. And my neighboring pastor, who for years I have never been close with, the guy is just a different cat. He's a different cat. He walks in a different dimension than I do. And we just, is that all right? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> Not everybody, I love everybody, but not everybody is just my best friend. And I, I, I'm telling you what, I, I would look at him sometimes and think, oh my, well, guess who God chose to use? <laughs> he called me up, he said, Phil, I'm on my way, you don't have to say a word, God just told me. He said, I'll be there in 30 minutes, fast as I can get there, I'm praying on the way and he said, you're going to start feeling strength. I have never had a man come and embrace me like that. He got into my shop and picked me up off the floor and started praying in the spirit until something snapped off of my light. It just, it just lifted. It was gone. How is God going to keep you when you're hanging on to the deck and the storm is raging? He might use an outside source, but keep hanging on, somebody. Don't discount the fact that God has ways of undergirding you when you run out of options. God's never out of options. Amen. It's never too late for him. And when you don't have enough strength, that's what the body of Christ is for. And God knows how. You don't, don't think you can live for God on your own. Don't even go there. Don't, don't ever come to me and argue that foolishness. You can't be a Christian and not go to church. I'm sorry. You cannot do it. It's not even worth discussing. Amen. You, it's a body. It's the body of Christ. The body has to be together to function. And you are never more acutely aware of the body than when you're in trouble. And the body rushes in to help out. Amen. I hope I'm helping somebody and not just offending you. All right. It says to rest yourself. Thank God for times of rest. In between waves crashing, there are moments of reprieve if your mind is in the right place. The danger is that we get to a point where we don't want relief anymore. We just want it to end. Can I be honest? Nobody, listen, nobody has ever fallen off of God's ship because the storm got too strong. They only fell off because they didn't want to try anymore. Because God promised he will not put more on us than we can bear. But if you hang on, if you just hang on, listen, you don't, at this point in time, you don't have to be the biggest preacher in Pentecost. You don't have to be the most spiritual looking person in your church, although at that point you may be more spiritual than you think you are. You may be the most spiritual that you've been in a long time because you're leaning on God, God harder than you ever have before in your life, but you won't feel very mighty. You won't feel very strong, but you are mighty through God. But there will come times of rest and reprieve in the midst of the waves. Grab every one of them that you can get. 
Come to every Wednesday night Bible study. Don't act like it's just church as usual. Go ahead and get a blessing on Wednesday night. Go ahead and grab it on prayer night. If it's just a little bit, it's going to be exactly what you need to hang on until the storm is done. They don't even skip going to a potluck. We just had an all-nations potluck last Sunday. No preaching, no worship, no prayer, but it was spiritual. Because the body got together and ministered to each other. There's no telling how many needs, needs were met all across those tables in the gymnasium where we ate. You just never know. The next one is to stand fast. We've got about 10 minutes. Stand fast. No, no other action is required at this point or can be taken. Just lock yourself in and hold on. Survive in order to thrive. Just put that in your mental notes. Survive in order to thrive. If you don't survive, it won't matter what blessing is coming down the road. Sometimes survival is the goal. We get so fixed on thriving that when we're not thriving, we don't feel like we're living for God. We don't feel like we're walking in the favor of God. Listen, if you don't survive, you will never thrive. So sometimes just hang on. All right. Stand fast. This is another one of the words or uh, meanings of that state, the word state. Stand fast. Stay. <laughs> Pretty simple. When you don't feel like you can stand any longer, just stay. Even when you're flat out on the deck and your grip is getting tired. Just stay. If you're getting tossed back and forth on the ship because you can't hang on anymore, you're still there. You're still in the ship. Right. Say, well, this is depressing. No, not when you come out of this, it's not. Amen. Listen, you might be getting slammed back and forth. The water's washing over the deck. You're slamming up against from one railing to the next, but guess where you're not? You're not overboard. Amen. You're still in the ship. Amen. So just stay. All right, and then finally, finally he said, I will keep you in perfect peace. If your mind is stayed on me, that word also means sustain. Sustain. It means to strengthen, support physically or mentally. And there will come a time where you can begin to be strengthened again. You will be strengthened again. To anybody that's in a deep, dark storm right now, that means absolutely nothing to you. Because you're absolutely convinced that what you're in, nobody's ever been in before. And the people that have been in it don't have any real unique answers for you other than hang in there. I'm praying for you. It'll get better. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can you tell me how it's going to get better? No, not really. I just know I outlasted the storm. Well, can you tell me? You got any knot tying techniques you can share with me? No, I, it was really too hard to tie knots at the time. I remember grabbing onto a few barrels and a little block and tackle. Anything I could get my hands on, it doesn't sound. You couldn't write a book about it <laughs> because it changes every time. God's storms are unique. But there will come a time for strength. It does come again if you don't stay in the lay down flat mode. I want to encourage somebody who is still ducking. That's not what God intended by the storm. Amen. He didn't intend for you to stay there. And uh, there was a point in time where several years back, I had come through basically 10 years of the storm with the business. I pastored two churches, one of them very, 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 very troubled, <laughs> extremely troubled. And uh, they hated my wife and I, to be honest with you. And... Uh, Made it known at every turn. At one point in time, I tried to turn in my license to my superintendent. I called and left three messages for him on every number I owned that he had. They are the right numbers. I use them to this day. I left it on his business number. I left it on his home number. I was serious about turning in my, shutting down my ministry. Uh, I, I left it on his cell phone. And to this day, he swears he never got any of those messages. And because he didn't return my call, I didn't feel like I had permission to quit. And so I stayed, and I survived. And I got through it, and God led me to the church that I'm pastoring now that is wonderful. 
I'm doing all the exact same things, and they love me for it. <laughs> and they thank me for it, and they buy me gifts, and they don't have to. But they tell me I'm wonderful, and I know they're being nicer than they should, but I'm the same person that pastored the other church. And I wouldn't have got there if they'd answered the phone call. <laughs> if he'd picked up the phone, I wouldn't be preaching here right now. God knows how to keep us. Because there will come a time of strength. And I remember the day that God spoke to me clearly in prayer. At the end of all that, he said, Phil, you don't know it yet, but the storm has been ended for a while. He said, what you're experiencing are rollers. And he took me back to my honeymoon where we went to Kauai. And I remember on the radio, in Kauai, the Hawaiian Islands, when, when the surf is up, everybody just goes. I think they skip school. They... Uh, they, they leave work, and they all head for the sea. And uh, I remember the radio announcing that there's been a storm in New Zealand, and the waves are about to hit our shore. And I'm telling you what, I mean, all of Kauai emptied out onto the beach. They were boogie boarding and surfing and doing all that stuff, and the waves were, were large but not destructive. They were enjoyable. They were the remnants of a storm that was somewhere else. And God said, Phil, that's what you're experiencing right now. He said, you're not in the storm anymore. He said, these are, you, you could actually start to enjoy yourself if you'd relax for a moment. <laughs> I said, God, I was still hanging on to the ship. He said, you know, the, it takes a while for the seas to die down. They don't end unless I just say peace be still, which only happened once. He said, uh, they die down naturally. But he said, it's okay to let go and start enjoying life a little bit again. I'm talking about peace. Does this sound like peace to anybody? Or survival? I'm talking, this is what the Bible calls peace. Thou will keep it in perfect peace whose mind does all of these things toward God. But he said, you can, you can start to be revived. You can start to enjoy. You can start to breathe again. You can start to survive and just and get into the thriving again because you trusted in me. And what a wonderful thing it was. I stopped being afraid of the rollers coming toward me because I realized there was no force left in them. Amen. It was just, it was just the remnants of a storm. And I, over the period of a year, that began to die down. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to tell you. Other than to say that for me, it was the greatest trial of my life. Why does he do it? He said, I'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed in me because, he trusts, because you trust in him. And uh, you don't have to trust in God until tragedy strikes. There is no such thing as trusting God outside of a storm. It doesn't take trust in God when you have a great job. You haven't trusted God even when you paid your tithes on a great income. Come on, be honest. 10%, give me a break. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I might have to teach on something else next time. Come on, you, we get off easy with God. He blesses us abundantly. I'm telling you. Can I, can I tell you that during my particular storm had a lot to do with finances. I went through a six-year period where every day I stood at the risk of losing everything I owned. And that caused me tremendous fear because it was the house my wife and kids were living in and the car I was driving and maybe the clothes on my back. I didn't know how far it would go, but it was a lot of pressure. And uh, the one thing, you, you said that would be a great time to stop tithing and giving your offering. Just so, You know what kept me sleeping at nights? It was my insurance plan that I had taken out with God. I said, God, you will not let me fall completely. Whatever's going on is part of your plan, but I have been faithful to you, and I will be faithful to you. Amen. I, you know what? I'm not going to get through this. Let me tell you one more faith story because some of you think that trusting God is just awful now. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's wonderful to get through some things. Some of you have been through more than I've been through. And you could teach this, but I'm telling you, it's wonderful to survive and to get out the other side. It's even more wonderful if you learn something from it. If you become what God wanted you to become because of it. God doesn't allow anything I better just, he said, he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is staying in you because he trusts in you. Listen, the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. 
And what's supposed to happen in my trial is I'm supposed to learn more about the love of God, how that it cannot fail me. I can't learn that when things are going well. It's not that we all have perfect knowledge of the love of God that casts out fear. That's why some people are sitting here tonight that still have fear. It's not that God's love is not perfect. It's that you don't have perfect understanding of his love. If you did, you would know he will never leave you or forsake you. He will never do anything intentionally to hurt you. He will not allow anything to hurt you that is not for your good. Anything he does allow past the barrier is for a purpose so that he can bless you even more than you've already been blessed. If you understood the love of God, you would never be afraid of a storm again. Oh, God. One more faith story. we got one minute. We're past time. I'll, I'll end on faith. During this particular storm, I had, I think I had uh, $4,000 in my bank account. My business bank account, not my personal. <laughs> and I needed $21,000 within three days to, just to pay the bills so I didn't lose my house. And, and, uh, and I, I, we had a missionary come through town. And I, this was during all that stuff I was talking. And a missionary come through town, and he came to our minister's planning breakfast. And I, I said, God, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I went and got that $4,000 out of the bank account. And I went to the missionary. I said, listen, I need a miracle in three days. I said, I need to get rid of this so God can put something else in. <laughs> I said, this is not near enough. I need to get rid of this so that God can bless me with more. He said, well, that's just interesting because I just happen to need this amount. He said, that just works out great. He said, I hope God blesses you like you hoped he would. <laughs> would you believe it? Within the next couple of days, people sent me money that had never sent me money before that was non-business related. Felt in prayer to send money, checks in the mail. Within the next couple of days, I got contracts that weren't even started. And the down payments were more. I'm talking about three days. In three days, this little tiny business of mine got not just $21,000, but ended up with $25,000 in the bank account while the storm was still going on. And I, I said, God, thank you for honoring our insurance agreement. <laughs> Listen, just because you give to God doesn't mean he has to bless you with money, but you can rest assured if you're faithful in the storm, if you're faithful, he will be faithful to his promises, even while the storm rages. That's why I can have perfect peace. Stand with me. Perfect peace is not the absence of the storm. It's walking with God in the storm. It's knowing how to lean on him in the storm. And no doubt, this is a Bible study night, but no doubt somebody here needs to lean on God right now. You need to prop something up. You're way beyond the point of leaning on him, but you, you now have flattened yourself out, and it's time for you one more time to make a resolve and say, God, it's Wednesday night, and I need what little bit of peace I can get to carry me through the rest of the week. I don't, I don't know if the storm's over, but I need a refreshing right now. I need the pressure lifted for a moment. I'm not going to miss this opportunity in the next few minutes to receive what I need to get to that next step. It's not about getting to the end right now. It's just about getting to the next step. Amen. That's what perfect peace is, my friend. Learning how to walk with God through all of that and not waiting for the storm to end, but learning how to enjoy God in the midst of it. He's here. Lift your hands right now. He's here right now. I'm talking to somebody who's in the midst of the storm. He's with you just as real as he was when you could feel him. He's just as powerful as he was before the storm started. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your voice right now like you, you would do if you were feeling him the way you wanted to. Lift your voice like you would right now if you were before the storm started. Hallelujah. If you danced in the presence of God before the storm, I encourage you to go ahead and dance now. He's the same God. If you shouted and juked and jived and worshiped before the storm started, just go ahead and do it anyway. He's worthy. He's going to bring you out the other side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These altars are open if you'd like to come and pray. Come rejoicing. Come doing things you don't even feel like doing. But you know God's worthy of it. Go ahead and prop yourself up by doing the things that you know would please the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. That's it. You may not even feel what you would like to feel before you leave tonight, but this time in the altar will not go wasted. You will not leave this place without something important that God intends to give you to endure the storm. God wants to give you staying power.